Hi everyone, Dr. Brent Siebold. I'm with Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. And I love working with people that want to make the world a better place. So one of the things I wanna share with you here today is this concept of futures thinking. Uh, in the class that I teach, Entrepreneurship and Value Creation, we talk a lot about design thinking and entrepreneurial mindset. But what we haven't spoken about recently is this concept of futures thinking. And I've noticed among my students and among many of your friends perhaps that the ability to kind of forecast out what the world might look like in as few as one year or two years or, or even five years is sometimes difficult for us to, to wrap our minds around what's next and then how to best prepare for how do we adapt to that uh, very real and looming future. So uh, the thing that I wish I would have learned sooner is this little, little talk that Steve Jobs gave back in 1983. Anybody know who Steve Jobs is? <laughs> Steve Jobs, rest in peace, is the co-founder of Apple. Uh, we were very fortunate to actually have his other, the other Steve, Steve Woz, gave a talk out on the patio a couple of years ago. So we are very in tune with the, uh, the, the design thinkers behind uh, all, all the Apple products that many of us in the room enjoy. So uh, I read about this, um, this concept of essentially futures thinking uh, that was framed in this, in this talk that was uh, given way back when uh, most of us were, were not even conceived. So uh, I wanna share with you a couple of quotes from this article. This is in Vice if you wanna Google it. Um, otherwise, we can share the link on the comments section of this video. But really what futures thinking uh, encourages, us, encourages us to do is to look for nodes of progress. And so I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of what these nodes look like. But essentially, anything that seems to you right now like, wow, this is kind of crazy sci-fi stuff that's being talked about in the news or people are talking about... Uh, artificial intelligence or robotics or machine learning or any of these things, this is what I want you to think about in terms of this is a node of progress and we need to pay attention to that as a means of imagining if this does become commonplace in the very near future, which I'm gonna argue is happening on almost every one of these fronts, how can I put myself in the right mindset to not only envision that to be commonplace, but to also respond to it in a very real way, okay? So what we're looking to do is unlock your creativity to respond to these movements or think about them as waves coming in and crashing on the beach. All of these disruptive emerging technologies are just starting to like become waves out in the ocean. And you all, imagine yourselves out in, out in uh, the Pacific Ocean or swimming, you have the opportunity to catch one, if not multiple of these waves and capitalize on that for your career. So the key takeaway from this article, and basically what Steve Jobs was saying, what I, what I learned from this article was, these things are, are inevitable, inevitable. If you're paying attention to them and you believe that uh, we as engineers, we as technologists, we as change makers, we as makers or engineers or builders can actually make good on the vision of these technologies, then why, why are we holding back? Why are we, why are we couching our, our vision of the future in some sort of doubt? It's almost like Steve is saying, hey, I'm an optimist, and I truly believe that personal computers will make my life better and millions of other people's lives better. So why is that so horrible to believe in? So I think we, as a community of, of techies and people that like to innovate in certain places need to take that optimistic view of these disruptive technologies. A lot of our families, a lot of our friends, a lot of people that are out there in the community might take a, a contrarian view. They might be scared about some of these technologies, rightfully so. And this might be one of the points we discuss during the Q&A section. So one thing I wanna share with you after I read this article is the class I teach is about two thirds engineers and one third business majors. And I, I inspire those students in my class to go ahead and, and build a solution to a pressing problem. And what I've seen over the past almost five years is that the solutions that the students are bringing to the table are in the past. 90% of the solutions hinge on 
app-based technology or touch-based technology. So the user interface, hopefully you all know what that is, UI, UX, the user interface they're proposing to me and to their classmates in these labs of developing new products and new services is basically based on old technology. So I'm challenging all of you to think about the future. And instead of building, thinking very hard and, and deliberately about a solution that's based on app technology, what if you thought about interacting with a solution using voice? Because this is one of those nodes of progress that is almost inevitable to happen. And so take an optimistic view. When, if we can get this right, and I know there's security concerns, but if we can get this right, wouldn't it be useful to be able to just communicate your need or desire in a very humanistic way versus having to fumble in your pocket, pull out your phone, and then find the right app, and then go through the right workflow? That's the old school methodology. What futures thinking and disruptive technologies will allow us to do is, is really push the boundaries of what's possible and how to get stuff done and how to make people's lives a little bit better. The other thing I want to share from this article, wish I would have learned this sooner, is this is happening fast. And for me personally, I made a bet with my, uh, with my cousin. Uh, my son is six years old, and I made a bet that he will never have a driver's license. And we bet $100. <laughs> he will never need a driver's license. And the reason I'm confident, first of all, it's 100 bucks. Uh, thanks to you all, I appreciate you funding my salary here at ASU. Uh, I made that $100 uh, should be okay to come by if I happen to lose. But based on this statement that was derived from this Steve Jobs talk back in 1983, two to three years, we're going to be much further along than we are now with self-driving technology and automation. And it's, we have to embrace this, especially if you're an engineering student or a business student or a design student. This is absolutely imperative to not only your personal success, but your ability to impact lives outside of this institution. So I want to show you, this is a really cool graphic. I don't expect you to read this, but we have scholars and big thinkers and technologists that are looking at the horizon of of disruptive technologies and really trying to categorize which ones are coming up very soon, which ones are a couple of years out, and which ones are just kind of crazy but still very important for us as creative individuals to think about. So I just wanted to make you aware that uh, Imperial College of London has done some of the hard work for you. If you're thinking about what is a disruptive technology, go ahead and Google that and you can see this really cool periodic table of disruptive tech. And they, they spent a lot of time and they've received a lot of feedback on iterating on this and I think the very first one, SN, stands for uh, smart diapers. I guess in London they call them knickers or, or, some, or nappies. They call them smart nappies. So anyway, kind of funny, but not funny for us, right? The humor here needs to be put aside, and we need to move towards embracing that IoT for smart diapers. That's already happening. It's in the bottom corner. It's low tech, and it's already here. So how do we put that as a baseline of our understanding of technology and then make a, a, a leap up from, from that standpoint. So the other thing I want to share with you, which dovetailed with this article that I read about Steve Jobs' talk back in the 80s and why, what his methodology for thinking ahead made Apple truly a success, was I had the, uh, the great honor to actually attend this conference. It's called uh, MARS, and it stands for Machine Learning, Automation, Robotics, and Space. And it's put on by this company called Amazon. Anybody heard of Amazon? Okay, good. So it, they sell products online. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> so anyway, I was actually in the crowd, not from this vantage point. I took a photo, but mine was really bad and grainy. I was on the other side of the audience and uh, got to hear from uh, this gentleman uh, being interviewed on stage. This is Jeff Bezos. And just by organizing this conference of bringing together academics and people that are in uh, the, the technology space commercially, is, a, is a really just a testament to say, we can't be thinking about e-commerce. E-commerce is old school, right? We need, as a civilization, need to be talking about how do we thoughtfully uh, design for the future, knowing that these are very distinct nodes of progress. So when we talk about nodes of progress, the challenge I'm giving to you, the wish I learned sooner for me was, I wish I would have put in a little bit more faith in the fact that these are almost certain to 
flourish within our society and our economy. And if we take these as known knowns, we take these as, we don't have to bet our cousin. These things are going to happen and they are going to infiltrate every aspect of our lives. Now we can be a lot more creative. If this is definitely gonna happen, I'm optimistically certain of that, and smart people in this room totally agree, then let's start talking about how we might build a solution knowing that that is a platform technology on which we can build. Let's not start in the past with thinking about how do we build a better app. Apps are dead. How do we build a better solution that might integrate with a robot to get some task done within your house or within your community or within your, your industry? And then this happened. I was in the crowd, so I just wanted to, this is kind of funny, but uh, as Jeff Bezos was talking about uh, the future of these disruptive technologies and how Amazon was playing a part, uh, a woman came from backstage and said, free the chickens. <laughs> I was there, it was awesome. Okay, so um, another, pl I, I, in full disclosure, I am sponsored by Amazon. Uh, they uh, gave all of us here in the room uh, $10, access to $10,000 through one of our funding tracks here at ASU for new products and services and ventures. This year, they've actually uh, given us $50,000. And so the challenge last year was how do we integrate a voice user interface to a solution to a problem that you might have within your, your life or your community or your uh, area of interest. And so now we're quickly seeing we're going from the, uh, the Echo Dot where it's just voice interface to now it's voice and visual interface. So this is, you, you might have seen this, this is called the Echo Show, right? So now you as technology developers, this is your new canvas. So when we talk about creativity, forget apps, right? And I'm not saying abandon apps because I know you still love apps are definitely useful in this present day. But the challenge, the wish I would have learned it sooner is we need to be thinking two years, five years ahead. That's what this is all about. That's futures thinking, okay? So this is your new canvas. How can you leverage this platform technology to solve a problem that you have right now in lab or within industry or within your community? Mark Cuban, anybody recognize this dude? So there's this show on ABC called Shark Tank. He can't look at it, he was at ASU, I think about a year and a half ago. Jared's laughing, he's from the W.P. Carey School of Business, and he wasn't even invited to go to this talk. There's like 10 people in the audience. I was, so, I was so upset, Jerry, we should have been there for this, right? But he was here, and guess what? Guess what Mark Cuban just said this, in this last six months? He said, if I were to start a business myself, and I'm not gonna start one now because it's hard work, but if I were going to, the one area that I would, I would build my business around is voice technology. Do you guys know that he said this? This is an actual quote from a billionaire who sees, oh, by the way, solutions pitched to him on a weekly, I mean, they're, they're stupid solutions in, in most cases, but he's tuned in to innovation in America and globally. And he said, if I, I don't know if he's being paid like I'm being paid to sponsor Amazon, but he, he legitimately said on a very broad stage that voice tech, it, he basically said it's the new user interface. So get with it. If you're gonna solve a problem, think about solving it using a human form of communication like voice and like visual. So take it from this guy, don't take it from me. This literally, I, I pasted this into my slides this morning. I read this this morning. McDonald's has a vision for tomorrow, and it's based on disruptive technologies. It's based on using artificial intelligence to get to know you better, as creepy as that sounds, right? So it's not just these big tech companies, it's state old fast food giants like McDonald's that are making moves, like you'll be expected to make moves, to stay one step ahead of what's definitely coming. The wave is coming whether you like it or not. The challenge I have for all of you is how do we embrace it right now? And how do we stay ahead of it? And how do we use it to craft the best solutions possible? This stuff is happening. If you're into AR, VR, AR, VR is happening. Kids are playing, get, you're probably playing, what's the game? Uh, Blade, what is it? What else? I mean, this, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yeah, the one I'm thinking of, Halo, you said? What's the big one, the, the crazy? Uh, the, Fortnite, thank you, Jared, yeah, right? So 
if AR VR isn't fully integrated with, with Fortnite yet, it's definitely going to be. So how do we as users of that product present a better experience? We have the creativity to leverage these technologies to envision what that future looks like. I'm a early rider, right? This is the bet. This is happening. No matter how many poor souls get run over while crossing the street, this ain't going away. I don't, right? You laugh, but I, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke here. But I'm saying, despite setbacks in the advancement of the technology, it's going to happen. You may or may not know this, but Uber and Lyft, their business models are unsustainable using the current technology, being humans. This is the only way those companies are going to remain a thing, right? It's coming. I'm going to win that bet. This is a video I took at the Mars conference. These products are going to be on the streets. So when we tell Amazon, hey, when we click buy, we want that product to drop onto our doorstep 30 minutes later, this is the means by which that will probably happen. You guys have seen the videos from Boston Dynamics. If you haven't, you need to go YouTube Boston Dynamics right now. It's an amazing company. Look at, I was, I was standing right here. Oh, stand back. <laughs> kind of creepy, but totally real. This is not going away anytime soon. It's only going to escalate. Are you going to get on the bus or are you going to stand by and watch? That's what I wish I would have learned sooner. Uh, so I, I did my undergrad here at ASU. Uh, and just about the time when I was ready to graduate, I was sitting in the Pat Tillman Veterans Center and uh, working on you know, finals, no sleep, no clues to what I was going to do in the future, no clue how to make it happen. And uh, a general, Carl Schneider, walked in and said, hey, son, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, sir, I, I have absolutely no idea, no plan whatsoever. I was just trying to get through this week through finals. Um, he's like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, well, I, I had a really rough time making it through school. You know, I went from the battlefield to the classroom, and I had a very different experience. And there's so many different experiences, right? I, I don't expect this table to have the same experience as that table, that table, that table. You guys are all come from different families, different regions, different experiences. What you're experiencing, you need to leverage that, okay? I did exactly that. I took my experience, and he said, hey, listen, there's a business plan competition in a week. So take your ideas and go make it better for the person who's coming behind you, right? There's always gonna be somebody following your exact path coming behind you, right? So catch the wave that's in front of you right now write it and make it better for the person who's coming behind you. So I did just that, right? I threw together a business plan in about a week and I won ASU's Edson Entrepreneur Initiative back in 2012. I spent about a year over at Skysong learning applied entrepreneurship and then I got a job for the state of Arizona uh, doing business grants, right? I was working for the Arizona Commerce Authority, basically funding people like you and I for their business ideas. And I gotta tell you, just like Cuban, I've seen a lot of crap ideas. I've had a lot of crap ideas. Um, you know, one of the things I'll say that, that's a Willis for me is I wish that I had you know, really figured out the game sooner. If you're looking to get funding for an entrepreneurial venture, well, go watch a bunch of pitch competitions. Go watch Shark Tank, go watch MIT's 100K, go watch, go watch the ones that are happening here at Skysong. Go watch them, figure out what the strategy is for angel investors. Figure out what the strategy is for VCs. Figure out what it is that they're actually funding and what it is they're kind of chuckling at, you know, after the thing is over. Uh, I had several startups I rolled from one to the next to the next to the next. And, and you gotta understand that timing is the number one killer of jobs, of, of getting a job, of having an entrepreneurial venture, it's time, right? It's the number one killer. At the time, when I, when I stopped doing my first startup and I went into my second, at the time there was a whole bunch of Special Forces soldiers who were getting shot in the back by the, the forces they were training. Tons of it. It was happening literally every day in the news, sometimes twice a day. All right? They were training up police forces and, and army forces, and the trainers were getting shot. So I came up with a device I call a mousetrap. You could retrofit it on the end of any rifle 
right? And it would basically utilize sensors on the soldier's uniform so that if somebody flagged them, right, pointing the rifle at them, it fired, right, the device, and it immediately slammed shut, closing the barrel. So if they pulled the trigger, it would backfire, right? I went down the street with this idea of the General Dynamics Edge Innovation Network, and a, a general over there started helping me take this thing to market. Now the irony about this was that while I was there, he showed me the Land Warrior system. Uh, has anybody heard of the Land Warrior system? No, it failed miserably, all right? It was a whole bunch of really cool gadgets, bells and whistles for, for you know, soldiers and Marines to have. Bunch of cool technologies. And the bottom line was they were too expensive. They were too expensive for expendable soldiers, right? Great technologies, cool, advanced, cutting edge stuff, never gonna happen, right? Same thing for my device, super cool, worked, right? Cost too much, you're gonna put 30 of these devices to save one expendable soldier's life? No, right? I rolled into my second one. I went and I went around the nation, I, I got people out of NASA basements, um, you know, I, I pulled a guy who was working on the Valkyrie. Anybody know the Valkyrie robot for NASA? Yeah, I pulled a guy off that project. I pulled a guy out of uh, Elbit Systems. I pulled a guy out of Boeing. I pulled a guy, uh, just the most brilliant all-star. Like, it was, it was like having Shaq and, and Jordan and LeBron all on the same team. It was ridiculous. Pretty much Golden State Warriors right now. Um, so we start working on DARPA projects, right? White, writing white papers for Swarm Robotics. Um, we, at the time, the software development kit for the Oculus Rift came out, and we started doing master and slave motion with robot heads, right? I put on the, the, the VR goggle, I move my head like this, and in Texas, the robot would do every movement that I did, right? So Avatar Robotics. Super cutting edge, super cool stuff, right? But the reality was that I wasn't yet aware of all the forces that could come into play as the waves of technology roll forward that could kill those things, right? Sequestration happened, they cut all new funding, that was that, right? Rolled on to my next one, right? At the time, Project Aura was happening. Project Aura, anybody heard of that? No? It was modular phones. Google picked it up, right? At the same time, 3D printing was exploding, right? It was just wildfire. MakerBot was, was the, all the rage. Everybody was just going crazy on additive manufacturing. I right? said, oh my God, this is the future. This is everything. So my team and I, we, we put together a new team. Uh, we just basically made a 3D desktop printer that could do uh, plastics of any kind. Uh, conductive metals and vacuum tube pick and place, right? Because we thought modular phones are the future, right? This is it. Google picked this up. Obviously, this is a note of progress. This is what's happening. Well, so we created that thing. We were about to get picked up by Techstars. And then at the last second, they went, you know what? No, it, it makes more sense that it's going to go the other way. Rather than it being distributed manufacturing where you've got one on your desktop and you've got one on your desktop and you on your desktop and you're using that little K-cup cartridge was the secret sauce of the thing, right? To plug in that new chip and the boom, you print off your new little module, which we all thought was, you know, brilliant. So did UTEP that we were working with on the, the uh, patents and everything. The bottom line was everything went the other way, right? It went to standardized boxes they're cheaply mass produced and people are creating apps, right? So what do you have to start to think about when you go back and think about what, you know, Brent was talking about, where we're at today. I tell you those stories to tell you that there's a whole bunch of things that can kill any one of those waves. It can be another wave, right? You can get up on your surfboard and another surfer comes along and knocks you off, right? You can get beat to the punch. You can be first in the hole, right? You can be first through the door and not survive. Right now, that's the state of consumer robotics, which is the space that I'm in. Consumer robotics is taking a beating over the last two years. Anybody familiar with Anki or Ankai, right? The little, little robot, yeah, 
Looks like a little, yeah. That just died, okay? They had millions and millions of dollars in sales. They were using Alexa's, Alexa voice technology, okay, and it died. Another company, Accutronic, uh, they created HROS. HROS is basically a bus that, that enables modular robotics, right? They, they made it so that any robot part can be used with any other robot part, right? That they can have that common language of, of ROS, robotic operating system, and that you can basically slap anything together that you want, any configuration, and, and that's a huge advancement for robotics. But they didn't have a product market fit, right? Because nobody wanted to pay them for that technology, right? Brilliant, amazing advancement in technology, but no commercial application. So when you go out there, right, after you graduate, or before you graduate if you're smart, and you're looking for a job, first thing you have to realize is that employers are looking, I love that you guys have these, these cogs on the wall, because every time I look at them, it reminds me, as an employer myself, and as a guy who's gone out and gotten plenty of jobs, the thing you need to realize is, we're CEOs, we're running a machine, right? Especially the larger it gets, the more machine-like it gets, right? So in Amazon or Microsoft, Google, they're a giant bureaucracy, they're a giant machine. And so when they create a job description, they're literally looking for a cog that goes into that machine, okay? If you fit that, you're the person who's getting hired. If you're not that, that's, you're not getting hired. If you're looking at entrepreneurship, then you don't have to necessarily fit that, but you still have to realize that you're working within a machine, right? If you wanna get funding, like I said earlier, there's a process for that. There are angel investors, there are pitch competitions, there's VCs, they all have a process, they have a strategy. If you're not working with that, it's gonna break, right? So I want to address some of these technologies that, that we were talking about. So did anybody see uh, Jack Ma and Elon Musk's discussion about AI? Anybody see that? Okay, if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend that you see it, okay? You're gonna see two brilliant billionaires talking at complete odds about every, they only agreed on one thing and that was population collapse, all right? Which is, more terrifying to me than AI. But um, they literally disagreed on everything, okay? One was coming at it from a heart perspective, one was coming at it from a head perspective, and never the two shall meet, right? So understand that even at the tip top level, nobody's necessarily agreeing on all these things. So then you have to start to think for your own career, whether you're going into a job or whether you're trying to start your own company, where am I at, where's the market at, and how can I catch that wave, right? So when you start to think about AI, you start to think about machine learning. You know, there's, there's supervised learning, there's unsupervised learning, there's, you know, rewards based. The, the bottom line is these things are, are technologies that are platforms that are going to continue forward, yes, but where are you within that, right? So there's a whole bunch of robot companies right now that are trying to use these things, use these technologies, and a bunch of them are failing, okay? And what they're starting to, to learn is that, that they're, they're really going about it the wrong way, right? So you kind of have to have divergent thinking. Everybody know what divergent thinking is? Please say yes. Please say yes. Convergent thinking, here's all these facts around me. I absorb them and, then, and I use them to try to support the conclusion I've already come to that I think is my idea that I'm married to, right? To make it work. Divergent thinking, I'm going, oh, here's a bunch of information and here's a bunch of solutions that are potential solutions. And I start to identify, oh, here's a solution, here's a solution, here's a solution. Which one's the best one for right now, for the market, for me? For, for everything, right? You gotta have divergent thinking. When you're looking to innovate, and you're looking to, to make a product, whether you're in, a, in Amazon or Microsoft or Google, or you're doing it in a startup, you have to start aligning those things to realize there's more to it than just creating a great technology. There's more to it than just finding a, a market, right? You can find a market, 
and then <laughs> create a technology for that market, and then the market moves on and it's done. The, the thing I, I guess I really want to say is, when it comes to AI, when it comes to machine learning, when it comes to all these technologies, look for those nodes of progress because that's what's happening right here and now. But also, think way out, right? So voice is the next big thing, right? Well, what about gesture, right? You gotta start thinking about things from a human-centered design perspective, right? So when you're going forward in, in thinking about how to create a product, and you're doing what's next, right, that next node, well, sure, that'll get you that incremental innovation. To get disruptive innovation, you have to think, what's the ideal? And then reverse engineer it back to what can I accomplish today, right? So I'll give you a for instance. I just got a super cool new coffee maker for my mom, right? It grinds the, the beans like on its own. Awesome, right? But I still have to push buttons like Brent was talking about in this ancient style of user interface, okay? Now, yeah, you could go incremental with that and you could give it voice. So I can say, hey, make coffee. Cool. Well, when I crawl out of bed in the morning, I want to be able to just like tap the thing like I would my dog, like, okay, buddy, let's go. <laughs> and have it understand, right, that I wanted to make coffee. Or even further out, I want it to know me so well, like what Brent was talking about with McDonald's AI, that it already knows, oh, Ben's waking up at six this morning. I'm gonna have some coffee right before. Right? When you start to use that other direction, you start with the ideal, and you work back to what's possible today, that's when you're gonna get the really good stuff. Time? Yeah, it's awesome.